Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrew Olson, and I'm with Advita Bioinformatics. Uh, this is the second installment in our NCI webinar series. Today's topic is to look at um, how to perform a meta-analysis using the iPathway Guide application. And we thought we would make today's topic a little bit more relevant to uh, researchers at NCI by looking at uh, an integrative analysis of some breast cancer subtypes using iPathway Guide. Uh, with me is my colleague, Dr. Sidra Hassan, and uh, she will be leading today's presentation. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sidra. Sidra? Good afternoon, everyone. So as Andrew, Andrew mentioned, the title of today's talk is Integrative Analysis of Breast Cancer Subtypes Using iPathway Guide. And the goal of this webinar is to familiarize you with the features and capabilities of meta-analysis in iPathway Guide using a publicly available data set. This is a breast cancer specific data set which I'll go into further detail later. So the agenda for today is that I will briefly go over the features of meta-analysis in iPathway Guide. I'll show you how you can generate a meta-analysis report in iPathway Guide and I'll also walk you through the layout of this meta-analysis. Next we'll dive into the case study using a publicly available data set in which I will introduce you to breast cancer and then I will also show you how you can answer specific scientific question and generate hypotheses using the meta-analysis features of iPathway Guide. In the end we'll have a brief Q&A session. So first of all using the meta-analysis feature in iPathway Guide you can quickly identify common or unique traits such as genes, microRNAs, gene ontology terms, pathways and diseases that are significant in your multiple contrasts. All of this is presented in the form of Venn diagrams and sortable columns. There's also a rank diagram available which I will show you in the application itself. We also offer correction factors within the meta-analysis that will also become clear as I show you in the application. Um, in the meta-analysis of iPathway Guide, you can build and compare up to five data sets. And it's cool because you can actually combine protein and gene expression data to look at the common genes, the common microRNAs, and the pathways between those different contrasts, which can really help build hypotheses. So I have listed here a step-by-step -step instru step -step instructions on how you can generate your meta-analysis report in iPathway Guide, but it will be more clear if I show you this in the application. If you need to refer back to this guide, there are steps listed here through which you can create your own meta-analysis. So let me dive into the application. If you have seen the first webinar and you have used iPathway Guide, I'm sure you are familiar with the dashboard in iPathway Guide. This is the home page that you come to when you log into the system. And this lists all of the contrasts that you have performed and their statuses. It is important to note that for meta-analysis, each contrast is analyzed independently before the meta-analysis report is generated. So I have the individual contrasts here that were derived from a public data set, GSE 65216 from GEO. To generate a meta-analysis, you will go on and click on this green button here, Create New Meta Report. Here you can provide a brief title for your meta-analysis. You can also provide a description for the same meta-analysis. I'm going to say breast cancer subtypes. When you are in the meta-report intake form, you will see all of the contrasts that were in the dashboard page listed here. So you can quickly select the contrast that you want included in the meta-analysis by clicking on the plus button next to the contrast. And then you click on this green arrow and you have selected this contrast to be included in the meta-analysis report. I'm going to select four of these contrasts. And once you have selected all the contrasts that you want in your meta-analysis, you can go on and click the Create Report 
green button here, it takes about a few minutes to generate the meta-analysis. To save time, I already have this meta-analysis generated in the dashboard, so I will go back to the dashboard. You can see the status is pending here. It takes about a few minutes for it to generate a meta-analysis report. So I'll click on the meta-analysis report that I had previously generated using these same contrasts. Within this report, you have each one of the individual contrasts. As you can see in the drop-down menu here, you have the TNBC versus healthy, HER2, luminal A and luminal B versus healthy, and also the combined meta-analysis report of these contrasts. I'll go ahead and click on the meta-analysis. So the default we have encountered a server error, so I'm going to quickly go back to the dashboard and restart this analysis. I'm going to go back to the meta-analysis that I was at previously. So as I was mentioning earlier that the default view of meta-analysis is the genes view. And I'm using this as an example to just describe the layout of the meta-analysis because it is exactly the same for microRNAs, gene ontology terms, pathways, and diseases. The very first thing that you will see here is a Venn diagram which shows, which compares these contrasts and it shows the uh, significant genes between these contrasts listed here. Right below that is a sortable column in which you can search for a, any gene of interest such as MAP kinase. You can also search through the entrez ID of the gene and you can also see this column as a rank diagram that I was mentioning earlier in the slideshow, which ranks each one of these genes based on their full change values. And this ranking is different in each one of the analyses, microRNA, gene ontology, and pathways that is more based on significance. To the right here, you will see gene details or details of the specific pathway that you're looking at that you have selected in the rank diagram or the sortable list. Right below that, in the genes view, you'll see the expression change by contrast. So you'll see the expression of the specific gene that you have selected in each one of the data sets that you're using for the meta-analysis. You also have literature references for your selection. So this is the general layout of the meta-analysis report of iPathway Guide. I'm going to go back to the slideshow to further go into the case study that we'll use as an example to go over the other features of meta-analysis. So once again, the steps that I went through are listed here if you need to refer back to them. Um, first of all, I will provide a brief overview of breast cancer because this is the data set that we're looking at. Breast cancer is the most frequently diagnosed cancer amongst women in the U.S. and it remains the second leading cause of mortality amongst women as well. There are many different ways to classify breast cancer and we are specifically looking at a classification based on the uh, hormone receptor status of breast cancer because it is relevant to the data set that we'll be looking at. So here you have four different subtypes of breast cancer which are stratified based on their gene expression pattern, specifically their hormone receptor pattern. First you have the triple negative breast cancer which is also called a basal-like breast cancer and this is um, hormonal independent and it has the worst prognosis amongst all breast cancer subtypes. Then you have the HER2 positive breast cancer and the luminal breast cancers that are further divided into two categories, luminal A and luminal B, once again dependent on the hormone receptor status. I wanted to show you a general um, pipeline to meta-analysis which is also relevant to the data set that we'll be studying. So first you have 
four different types of breast cancer tissue samples and each of them is compared to a healthy control and we assume that you have biological or technical replicates for each one of the conditions you're analyzing. You perform gene expression profiling through various platforms available and the primary analysis of the data that is obtained from these is alignment and annotation. Then the secondary um, analysis is differential expression where you are able to generate a log fold change between your comparison and your control. In this case, let's say TNBC versus healthy or HER2 versus healthy. And then these log fold change are analyzed by pathway log fold change and the associated p-values are analyzed by pathway analysis. As Andrew went over this in the very first webinar, iPathway Guide is performs tertiary analysis in the bioinformatics pipeline. And now we can take each one of these individual reports and combine them in the form of meta-analysis also through iPath iPathway Guide. And this is a form of a quaternary analysis. So using a public data set, which is the number, the identifier, which is listed here, which is a breast cancer cohort that contains all four of those molecular subtypes of breast cancer, we wanted to ask some very generic questions that as a life science researcher you may have once you get this gene expression analysis or meta-analysis of this data set. So the first question that we ask is what are the common molecular mechanisms between each subtype of breast cancer? How can you identify mechanistic regulations to generate hypotheses using the pathway analysis of iPathway Guide? And thirdly, how can you identify plausible biomarkers for a given phenotype? You might have some other specific questions, but by showing you how you can answer some of these generic questions, you might get a better idea of how you can answer your specific question through the analysis results that iPathway Guide provides. Briefly, I will go over the approach and the methodology that we use in iPathway Guide to score and rank pathways. We use a unique um, method called impact analysis, which combines two types of evidence, perturbation and enrichment. Perturbation is a form of pathway topology. I'm not going to go into further detail about this because this was covered in the first webinar. You can refer to the first webinar if you need more information about these methods. But briefly, in the pathways view, you will see a graph in which you'll see perturbation on the y-axis and enrichment on the x-axis. And anything that is above this diagonal line is considered to be significant. Using the two types of evidence instead of one greatly minimizes the false positives that you obtain in gene expression analysis just using one form of, by just using one form of evidence. So back to the case study, the very first question we had is that what are the common molecular mechanisms between each subtype of breast cancer? I'm going to go back into the application to show you how you can answer this question. So I was here on the genes view of the meta-analysis. And obviously to answer a common mechanistic question, we wanted to look at the pathways. I'm going to go ahead and click on the pathways. Let me expand this. So the pathways is also laid out the same exact way that the genes view is. You will first see a Venn diagram followed by a sortable list and a search box in which you can search for a specific pathway if you're looking for that. And here you have more information about the pathway that has been selected and also the differentially expressed annotated genes to that specific pathway in each of the contrasts. And this is color coded based on the Venn diagram and the table. And you also have literature references. Because we're looking for the common molecular mechanisms, I can go ahead and sort this list and just look at the 38 pathways that are common amongst these four subsets of cancers. So this has shortened this list to only the 38 pathways that are common amongst these cancer subtypes that we are looking at. As I mentioned, you can apply correction factors here. I'm going to go ahead and apply false discovery rate. 
which will further shorten the list. So now you have 16 pathways that are the most common significant pathways amongst these four breast cancer subtypes. I can also look at this in the form of a rank diagram. So this rank diagram ranks the pathways based on significance. And you can see here pathways in cancer is very significant amongst all four of these subtypes. If I wanted to further probe into this common pathway, I can look at the differentially expressed annotated genes that are listed here for this pathway. And as I mentioned earlier, these are color coded based on the color scheme that is described right here. So we can see here the androgen receptor, AR, is downregulated specifically in the TNBC data set, whereas it's upregulated in the luminal A data set. If I wanted to get more information about androgen receptor, I can click on androgen receptor here. This will take me back to the genes tab, where I have more details about this specific gene. And I can also see the expression change of this gene in each one of the contrasts. So AR was measured in all of these contrasts, however, it was significantly differentially expressed in only two of these contrasts in the path, which is why only two of these contrasts were shown in the pathway details view. Next, if I wanted to specifically look at what is going on with androgen receptor in the context of the pathways in cancer, the signaling pathway that it is important in, and I can choose any one of these subsets, the single analyses, to further probe, if, uh, probe to further probe any questions or to further probe into androgen receptor within the signal within the pathway. So let's say I was specifically interested in androgen receptor in the luminal A subset because it is overexpressed, significantly overexpressed in the luminal A subset. I can quickly go back to the single analysis of luminal A versus healthy. And the first page that you'll see is a summary page which describes the top results for each one of the analyses here. Since I'm interested specifically in the pathway, I'm going to go ahead and click on the pathways view. Once again, I will apply the correction factor FDR that I had applied in the meta-analysis. And you can see here that pathways in cancer has both forms of evidence, enrichment and perturbation. I will go ahead and click on pathways in cancer. This here gives me the pathway diagram of pathways in cancer. And you can clearly see that AR is overexpressed in this pathway by the red color shown here. And you can enlarge this or make this smaller as pathways are very complicated and navigate through the pathway map. The default view of the pathway map is the log fold change that was measured. If I wanted to see the downstream propagated effect of these log fold changes, I can click on total accumulation. And if I wanted to see the sum of this total accumulation plus log fold change, I can click on total perturbation. I can also show putative mechanisms through by clicking on coherent cascades. And what these red lines indicate is that it are the interactions that agree with what was measured and what are the expected changes in the pathway. So we can see here that AR is a highly enriched and perturbed gene. It is one of the sources of perturbation in the system along with ECM and PDGF. However, we wanted to concentrate on the androgen receptor. Because this is a source of perturbation within this pathway, maybe we wanted to therapeutically target AR. And we have options available here where you can see the drugs that specifically target this pathway. And if I wanted to shorten this list, 
and look at drugs that specifically target AR, I can go ahead here and click on AR. So now the list has become stratified to the drugs that are specifically um, shown to target androgen receptor. And I can click on each one of these drugs and look at the targets as well. This is important because a drug can have more than one target. So if there was a drug mentioned here, which had more, uh, which was targeting more than the androgen receptor, another gene in the pathway, it would be listed here. The name of the gene would be listed right here. Next, if I was interested in looking at the regulation of androgen receptor in the signaling pathway, I can look at the microRNAs that regulate androgen receptor within this pathway. And here you have a list of the microRNAs that specifically regulate androgen receptor. And the same goes here, where you can click on the microRNA and look at its regulatory targets. This is a computationally predicted, um, these are computationally predicted microRNAs that have been shown that to target the genes in the pathway. As most microRNAs have more than one target, you can see that each one of the targets of a specific microRNA that you have highlighted is circled here within the pathway map. Also, as pathway diagrams tend to be complex and get very busy, we have a box plot here which shows the differentially expressed genes in that pathway for simplification. So overall, using the pathway analysis, you can directly map the drugs and microRNAs and other options that are available, which I'm not going to go into further detail in this webinar, right on the pathway, which can help you generate hypotheses for your experiments. I'm going to quickly recap everything that I have shown you so far. So the very first question that we were asking is that what are the common molecular mechanisms between each subtype of breast cancer? By using the meta-analysis, we were quickly able to identify pathways in cancer to be a highly perturbed and enriched pathway amongst all four subtypes of breast cancer. And we also used the rank diagram here, and through which uh, rank, rank diagram here, and we also were able to see the differentially expressed annotated genes to the specific pathway that we selected. Next, by clicking on a specific gene of interest, such as androgen receptor, we were able to see the see its expression in all of the contrasts that we were measuring in the meta-analysis here. And androgen, the differential expression of androgen receptor amongst these subtypes sort of serves as a proof of concept because we know that triple negative breast cancer is a hormone independent subtype. Therefore, we expect androgen receptor to be downregulated specifically in TNBCs as compared to the other subtypes we were studying, which are all hormonal responsive. The second question we had is how can you identify mechanistic regulations to generate hypothesis using pathway analysis? For which we specifically looked at the most significant pathway across the breast cancer subtypes, pathways in cancer, but then we narrowed it down to the luminal A subset because we wanted to know what was going on with androgen receptor within the um, pathways in cancer in this specific subtype. And in the pathway map, we were not only able to see the log fold changes of each gene, but we were also able to see the perturbation and the coherent cascades in the, within this pathway map. And there was a table that I showed you, um, not a table, a box plot that I showed you, which is right below the pathway map that simplifies everything that you are seeing within this map because it shows the differentially expressed genes within that pathway. Next, by mapping the drugs and microRNAs directly on the pathway, we were able to get a list of drugs that specifically target our um, therapeutic target, which is androgen receptor. We were also able to get a list of the microRNAs that regulate androgen receptor in this pathway. The third question we had is how can you identify plausible biomarkers for a given phenotype? 
So, so far we have looked at a common mechanism and a common gene that was differentially expressed between subsets. Now we want to look at something that was unique to a given phenotype. I'm going to go back into the application and show you how you can do this. So if you go back to the pathway analysis of the meta-analysis, once again, we have the Venn diagram here, and initially I was looking at the 38 common pathways between the four subsets of breast cancer. Let's say I was specifically looking at a biomarker for TNBC, or looking for a biomarker for TNBC because this is the most aggressive um, breast cancer subtype that we are studying. I can highlight the 23 pathways that are unique to TNBC. I can go ahead and apply a correction factor, and I can also make this list into a rank diagram. And DNA replication comes up to be the most significant pathway in TNBCs, which is not significant in the other three data sets that we're looking at. I have more information here about this DNA replication pathway. And then I also have a plot here which is showing the differentially expressed annotated genes in the DNA replication pathway. You can quickly go through this plot here and see that members of this MCM complex tend to be specifically upregulated in the TNBC data set as compared to the other data sets. There are obviously alternative ways that you can come to these conclusions. Let's say I was interested in the biological processes that are unique to TNBCs as compared to the other data sets. So I can go in gene ontology and click on biological processes. Gene ontology terms are also, uh, are also organized the same way that pathway terms are organized. So once again, we have a Venn diagram here, and we're specifically interested in biological processes that are unique to TNBC. So I'm going to go ahead and make shorten my list to those that are unique to TNBCs. And then I can apply a correction factor here. It is important to note that correction factors for gene ontology terms are different than those for pathways because gene ontology is a hierarchical organization. So we have these elin pruning and weight pruning correction factors and you can apply, elin pruning being the most stringent, so I'm going to go ahead and apply that. I can also view this list in a rank diagram form. So what is interesting here is that biological processes that are primarily involved in DNA replication, such as DNA strand, strand elongation, duplex unwinding, are also very significant in TNBCs just the same way they were significant in um, just the way the DNA replication pathway was significant in the pathway analysis. So I can go ahead and click on one of these terms. And the same way it was in pathway analysis, I can see the differentially expressed annotated genes to this pathway. And interestingly, once again, we see the MCM complex members being significant uniquely to TNBCs as compared to the other subsets. So let's say I'm interested in MCM2. This seems like a plausible biomarker, especially because it is overexpressed. That's what we were looking for when we look for biomarkers. We're looking for a gene or a protein that is overexpressed. So I'm going to go ahead and click on MCM2. This will take me back to the gene details view. And once again, I have the same gene details view where I can view the expression change of MCM2 across these subsets of um, breast cancer that we're studying. And if I wanted more information about MCM2, besides the gene details provided here, I can click on an external link, which will take me to the NCBI website describing MCM2, and this provides more information than you need about MCM2 if you were specifically interested in studying that. So in summary, in trying to identify a plausible biomarker for a given phenotype, 
we identified MCM2 to be a marker specific to TNBCs, which was not significantly um, differentially expressed in the other data sets. We also got some more information about MCM2 as in what it's involved in and how it is regulated. And we also know that it is a component of the DNA replication and cell cycle pathway. And all of this information is provided within the genes view tab. I also showed you how you can stratify your data or generate or use the gene ontology um, analysis to generate hypotheses or to identify biomarkers. We went into gene ontology where we selected gene ontology terms, biological processes that were specific to TNBCs from which we got DNA replication initiation and we found that MCM2 was specifically annotated to this biological process. Now I'll show you an example of a functional validation of a public data set. So I took a public data set um, and I analyzed, uh, I analyzed that data set using iPathway Guide and we found MCM2 to be significant uniquely in TNBCs based on our differential expression threshold. Then I wanted to know more about the role of MCM2 in TNBCs and a quick PubMed search brought me to this paper. This is a recently published paper by an independent group which did not use this publicly available data set. They had their own TNBC and other breast cancer tissue samples. And it was actually really interesting because their data agrees with what we had found through the analysis of a publicly available data set where you can see that MCM2 is highly overexpressed in TNBCs and it is overexpressed in HER2 as we had seen in the publicly available data set but not as significant as that in TNBCs. They further performed a functional study for which I have put a citation here. They also correlated the expression of MCM2 to cancer stem cell markers such as ALDH1 and CD133. So in summary, in this webinar, we have gone over the features of meta-analysis. How can you generate a meta-analysis report and a general layout of the meta-analysis view of genes, pathways, microRNAs, gene ontology terms and diseases? And then by using a publicly available data set, we were able to identify common traits across the experimental conditions and we found the most significant common pathway amongst the subsets we were studying to be pathways in cancer. We further probed the regulation of androgen receptor in the luminal A subtype of breast cancer, which can really help us to generate hypothesis. We were able to get a list of microRNAs that regulate androgen receptor, and we were also able to get a list of drugs that target androgen receptor. And lastly, by using the meta-analysis feature, whether it's pathways, gene ontology terms, or diseases, if you were interested in that, we were able to find a plausible biomarker for TNBC in the form of MCM2. And then in the very end, I showed you an example of a validation of a publicly available data set. And this is all for the webinar today that I am presenting. With that, I will take any questions.